Hey, what's up, you guys? Welcome back to BTM to the Basketball Time Machine, the podcast about former NBA players. But before we get to today's guest, just a little reminder, if you want to hear more podcasts like this one, make sure you hit that subscribe button to always be up to date when we post a new video. So let's get right into the podcast. So today's guest was drafted in 1981 by the Kansas City Kings. Kevin Lutter, welcome to the show. Hey, welcome. Thank you for having me, Sean. Uh, great to be a part. Wonderful. Are you still following the NBA? Absolutely. Uh, I'm here in Houston, Texas. Um, I'm the vice president of the NBA Retired Players Association. Uh, I have the Houston Rockets, who are on my executive advisory board. So uh, still involved intricately um, with the local team and have several friends of mine uh, across the NBA footprint uh, who are participating. Uh, one of my teammates, uh, Larry Drew, has just taken over the uh, Cleveland Cavaliers. He was our point guard. Yes. So, yeah, still connected as much as I can uh, at All-Star Weekend. We um, This past year in L.A., we... Uh, participated in that so uh, as close as I could possibly can okay wonderful you got a favorite player at the moment you know uh, enjoying uh, the guys today uh, the teams today the transition today uh, understanding the difference between old school and new school uh, you know uh, just enjoying those that compete and those that play at a high level so uh just admiring those guys uh, from afar, on and off the court. All right. So you were the 17th pick of the 1981 NBA draft, a very deep draft class. Let me give you some names. Mark Aguirre, Isaiah Thomas, Buck Williams, Orlando Rurich, Tom Chambers, Rolando Blackman, Frank Johnson, Herb Williams, Larry Nance, Eddie Johnson, and the list goes on and on and on. Going into the draft, did you know that your draft class would be so deep? You know, uh, I knew it was very competitive. Uh, I'd actually, in 1980, um, we were a NAI small school at that time, Alabama State, and we were ranked number one going into the Kansas City Championships and uh, in where the NAIA Championships were held in Kansas City. So I was offered a contract to come out. What we called it then was hardship. Uh, today it's called one and done and two and through. But uh, to come out early and uh, turn that down. So it was the first time that I was really, uh, you know, uh, being observed by uh, the NBA and uh, really, you know, having my dream come to my doorstep. And and so uh, that next year uh, went over to Hawaii uh, after the season because we did not go as deep into the postseason as we had before. Um, and uh, played against the top 40 guys in the nation. Uh, Kelly Trapuca, Mike McGee, Danny Vrain, some of those guys that were drafted that year uh, that were at the small forward, uh, you know, big guard position and fared well, went back into the first round and, uh, as the story's told, was able to come out uh, the 17th pick and be less than 1% of those that ever uh, get that opportunity. Yeah. Take me back to, to the draft day. What do you remember? Well, uh, excitement. Uh, I mean, you know, Sean, we, we loved the game back then. Uh, we played it. Uh, you know, in the, the sand lots, the parking lots, the backyards, and uh, the love of the game, we would have done it for nothing. So being able to be amongst the elite in the world, the best in the world, uh, and be a part of that, the excitement at that particular time was, was probably overwhelming. So, um, you know, uh, that, that was probably... Uh, The most exciting part about uh, the whole piece was that, you know, uh, you know, being being chosen, that dream coming to reality, being able to walk into something that you've been daydreaming about for for years and years. You've worked very hard to get to that particular point 
And uh, now it's about to become a reality. Was there any special player you were really looking forward to play against? Oh, absolutely. Uh, Who's that? My idol was uh, Julius Dr. J. Irving. Oh, you got to be kidding me. I actually wrote down to ask you if Dr. J was your idol, and I forgot it. Ah! <laughs> and, um, and, and so uh, um, having an opportunity to, uh, you know, to meet him and play against him, um, you know, had watched him, you know, back then, uh, you only got, uh, NBA once a, once a week on Sunday, the, uh, the, the CVS game, of, game of the week. So, um, I remember being in the spectrum. My first time I was starting, uh, just kind of enamored by the whole experience and, I was bringing the ball up and I hit the wing and I'm, I'm running through the middle like, oh my God, I'm, I'm playing against Doc, I'm in the spectrum, and uh, Bobby Jones hits me with a forearm and Steve Mix, you know, hits me in the back of the head, and then uh, Daryl Dawkins uh, took me and threw me up against the back. <laughs> uh, Welcome the to the NBA. Yeah, yeah, and it's like, don't come through here anymore, rookie. And I'm like, I am in the NBA. <laughs> Good one. As mentioned earlier, you were drafted by the Kansas City Kings. What were your expectations for your rookie season? Well, uh, to, to really come in and make an impact, um, what had happened in Kansas City is that um, – The year before, uh, 1980, they'd had a very successful season and gone to the playoff finals against L.A., uh, in which they lost uh, in the conference finals. Uh, Otis Birdsong and Scott Webman were uh, the, the shooting guards and the uh, small forward at that particular time. Both of them became free agents um, and, uh, you know, took their, their talents elsewhere. So there was a vacancy there at both of those positions in which I played uh, or was considered a swing person. So the opportunity to come in and make an impact and fill those big shoes, those guys between them had uh, probably um, both averaged, you know, right at 20 or better points a game. So, uh, you know, that was a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of big shoes to fill. Yeah. So in 1981, was there any rookie that surprised you? Rookie? Yeah. I mean, I mentioned What? so many guys like like Frank Johnson, Herb Williams, Larry Nance, uh, Rolando Blackman, Eddie Johnson, Mark Aguirre. Any of the guys where you said, oh, that guy is way better than I thought? Well, um, getting a chance to really compete against those guys. Um, but um, what happened with me is that being from Michigan, uh, connecting with Magic and... Uh, Uh, again, uh, we played in Magic's Round Ball Classic. So I got a chance, uh, you know, to play with some of the, the greatest in a what was kind of a offshoot, uh, which was, you know, summer uh, exhibition games where we played the rookies against the, the, the veterans. So uh, my team consisted of some of my draft mates, uh, Mark Aguirre, Isaiah Thomas, Um, you know, uh, Dominique Wilkins, and we would go against guys like Magic, uh, George Iceman Gervin, uh, you know, and we played in about 12 or 14, uh, in, you know, non-NBA cities, you know, Kalamazoo, Michigan, Lansing, uh, St. Louis, some of these places, you know, Louisville, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, And, you know, we would have some great battles and scoring uh, fun. And uh, that's when I really got a chance to see uh, how great uh, a lot of the players that I was going to compete against were. All right. Your coach was Cutting Fitzsimmons. Did he tell you what your role on the team is? You know, um, I knew that Uh, my role was going to be coming in to really make an impact. Um, I think the biggest transition for me 
was that it was uh, moving from a collegiate um, environment to a pro environment, which now it's a business. So uh, a lot of the business side of the organization was not explained and uh, everybody's competing for uh, time and position. And, and so that's, that's not always understood by a young player. And so uh, working with Cotton, uh, who was uh, you know, a seasoned coach, uh, really understanding that role, um, you know, it was uh, you know, pretty daunting. Uh, to be honest with you, and uh, really, you know, had some challenges finding my way in those first couple of years. All right. Who was the toughest guy you ever had to play against in the NBA? <laughs> I want to hear a name. They're all tough. They're, they're, they're all tough. I, could, I could run off uh, a bunch of names. Uh, you know, uh, we talked about Julius. We talked about Magic. We talked about Isaiah, Mark Aguirre. Uh, you know, we talk about, you know, guys like, uh, 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 you David know, Thompson. well, David was, was tough. Uh, you know, Bernard, uh, Ooh, yeah. um, you know, there were a lot of guys, you know, Alex English that Ooh, yes. Oh, yes. now carry hall of fame names, but you know, everybody in the league um, had the ability to be there. And so when you say the toughest, there the list goes on. All right. Is there any NBA player, say, who's underrated? Or who, who's the most underrated NBA player of all time, to, to your opinion? Well, I mean, there's guys that, uh, stayed around the league. Uh, I guess the what we call the blue collar workers that um, did the unsung things. Guys like T.R. Dunn. You know, uh, T.R. was a defensive specialist uh, with the Denver Nuggets. Uh, of course, they had a high powered scoring team, but he did the dirty work. He guarded the the toughest players, the scores, the people that put up numbers. Uh, and nobody really talks about that, but, you know, this guy hung around 10, 15 years, uh, you know, doing the things that were uh, not showing up in the, uh, in the, in the scores box, uh, not showing up in the, uh, you know, in the media, not showing up, you know, as far as being a heralded player, but, Every year, he worked hard at his craft, and uh, you know you were going to have a, a tough battle against TR. All right. So you played 71 games and even started in 13. Do you feel that it was way harder back then to get minutes as a rookie? Well, um, you know, it's a competitive league. I think that uh, the biggest challenge is that people don't understand that Yes, getting to the NBA is, you know, you're less than 1% of those that ever pick up a basketball. But sustaining that is even tougher because every year you've got another class and another crew uh, coming for your position. And uh, the average career is three years. You know, long careers are not uh, the norm. They are the exception. So, um, you know, uh, remaining... Uh, relative, competitive, and, you know, uh, in that mix is uh, one of my teammates, uh, Eddie Johnson. Oh, absolutely. From, absolutely. From Illinois played, um, you know, 20 seasons. So that is not the norm. That is the exception. Absolutely. Absolutely. Magic Johnson and Larry Bird were the biggest stars in the early 80s. Of course, Dr. J, I include him. But did you know that... Larry Bird and Magic Johnson were special in their younger days, so in their rookie season, their first season? Oh, yeah. Um, you know, those two were the consummate professionals. Um, if you look at those guys over their careers, um, not only were they 
on the elite teams, in the conversations uh, about the best in the league, uh, you know, in the championship games, making the big plays, leading their teams. But they always uh, seem to increase uh, in one category, um, on one improvement in their, you know, or another, uh, meaning that their shooting percentages, both field goal and and free throw or assist, you know, rebound, steals, they were always competitively in the top, you know, one, two to five in every category over the course of their years amongst the greatest in the world. So you don't do that and sustain that and be uh, visible and uh, in those conversations um, with the teams that they were with uh, without being a consummate uh, professional and being special. So uh, special people on and off the court. And uh, I was uh, I was blessed to be a, a part of uh, that era. Okay, so um, at the end of your rookie season, you averaged seven points and almost three boards in only 16 minutes. Some pretty good stats for a rookie. Do you think in hindsight you deserve more playing time? Well, it's interesting. Um consistency uh and how the coaches approach that you know a lot of uh coaches including cotton during that time uh some of the old school coaches didn't believe in necessarily playing rookies uh they liked the veteran guys they thought that the veteran guys brought a lot more to the table unlike today where you know the average you know age is you know 21 to or 19 to 26, and you after 26, you considered a you know an old guy a fossil. I didn't think that I was at 25 or 26 that I was, uh, you know, out of the league back in the day. But um, to your point, um, the younger guys didn't get a lot of playing time. They would sit for a year and watch the, and and many many coaches approached it from that 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 approach. So getting that time early and uh, and then that first year, a unsung or unprinted stat uh, was the kind of the first time of analytics where production per minute, uh, I was right behind uh, Michael Cooper of the Lakers in, uh, you know, producing. So, um, you know, it was a it was a solid year, but um you know, you still needed to build on it. Okay. In your second season, in 1982, your team becomes really good and Larry Drew and Eddie Johnson are just taking off. Um, you guys won four to five games, which still wasn't enough to make the playoffs. How disappointing was that? Well, it was real disappointing because it went down to literally the last game of the season where... Uh, we went to Denver, we had identical records, and the winner goes to the playoff for that last position. And they beat us by uh, about three to four points. And so um, it was literally down to the wire in the last game of the season. Uh, they had the, they had won the, um, you know, we played six games and they had, won the uh, home court advantage of of that uh, series to be able to have that game there. And, uh, you know, we couldn't, uh, you know, beat them at that particular time. So it was, you know, it was disappointing, but uh, also gratifying that we were still a young team that uh, of not a lot of superstars and, uh, and, and competing to get into the playoffs. All right. If you had the choice between playing in today's NBA or playing in the 80s, what's it going to be? You know, um, <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to qualify this question. I love playing in the era that um, I played in, so I wouldn't trade that for anything because um, I, I still played against and with the best in the world and some of the best to ever play the game. Uh, I just wish that uh, 
the salaries were somewhere close to, <laughs> uh, you know, where they're what they're making now, uh, we would be having a different conversation. But I do not regret playing in the 80s. Uh, I would love to have been on some of our teams and competed against some of these guys because they kind of think that uh, they still they made this game. But uh, we had some great competitors, and uh, I would have, you know, I'll match up with them anytime back in the day. <laughs> Let's talk about the, the, the um, current NBA superstars like LeBron James, um, um, uh, Curry, for example. Yeah, let, let's talk about Curry. Do you think he would have the same impact in, in the um, 80s as he has today? Well, let me tell you, uh, these guys are special in any era. Okay, so um, I watched Curry the other day. Um, he went for 51. Um, he's shooting from 30 feet and out with ease on the transition from all over the floor. Um, what, as a former professional athlete, the skill level um, to be able to uh, have those kinds of nights where um, you, from every shot that he takes, he would have to have taken that shot at least 10,000 times to be able to be as consistent that he is, uh, as he is. And He needs to have been uh, have a confidence that he's made that shot, and because it's all muscle memory, and when you see the way that he shoots the ball with ease, um, the strength, and the way that that ball hits uh, the net with a stroke, um, that skill level is just untaught. It is strictly a dedication and a commitment. And, and so my hat's off to this guy. This guy is skilled at any particular uh, era. And for him to be able to stretch the floor and do that with a consistency. Now, back in my day, that was a bad shot. Absolutely. Okay? <laughs> True. Okay. You know, and you didn't, if you had even made it other than the fact that it was shooting at a buzzer, um, you may have been taken out. So you got the NBA horn. Okay. So... But the fact that that guy is able to stroke that, the other night he shot 63% from the field, um, nearly 60% from 30 feet and out. It's just phenomenal. Absolutely. Yeah, true, true, true. So you had your last NBA game in 1983. What have you been doing since then? I guess um, a lot. 84. 84 uh, was my last game. Uh, with the Clippers, and and um, and so uh, since then I've uh, I had a degree in marketing, a minor in management. Uh, I my first uh, position uh, after a uh, several opportunities in the CBA to get back, and it didn't happen, was to use my degree and go to work. Uh, my first corporate position was with uh, Zenith Electronics as a buyer. And, uh, in 2005, uh, I, um, you know, uh, established my own company in business consulting. And, uh, today I, uh, consult with, uh, small businesses, uh, 20 million and under and nonprofits and, uh, work with them in business development, resource development, financing, uh, everything to formalize them and, uh, help them be a uh, successful company. So um, just grateful that, you know, have an education and sports and basketball was, uh, you know, one of those uh, uh, allowing my athletics to pay for my education. And that's my, my mantra and my message to uh, a lot of the young athletes today uh, and let your, your athletics and your academics pay for your education. That's the longevity. You just talked about the end of a professional um, NBA career. So many players struggle when it comes to the life after the NBA. Um, and you told me earlier that that's exactly where you come in. Tell me more about it. Well, um, you uh, you may or may not know the the research numbers in 
football, basketball, baseball are 50 to 60 percent of uh, retired athletes within three to five years or uh, divorce broke and without a uh, career path, especially. Um, and, and so uh, the conversations um, in the NBA boardroom, the NBPA, which is the Players Union, and the NBRPA, uh, which is the Retired Players Association, is how do we combat that? What are some of the things that uh, we do to assist our our brethren and sistren because um, the Retired Players Association consists of retired NBA, ABA, uh, Harlem Globetrotters, and WNBA, that we... Uh, do a better job of transition. And the first thing is always been mental health. Uh, the mental health piece is it doesn't matter what your bank account says, uh, that, you know, you must have an exit strategy and be thinking about how you transition where from a craft that you spent an enormous amount of hours and time married to uh, a sport that you had a love for and what you what you do with that uh, mentally uh, as well as physically, so uh, that transcends to your practical daily uh, health and welfare. So uh, those conversations are you know being had, and there's a lot of support. Uh, we're trying to really understand how that best um, you know translates and. Uh, you know, stay tuned. That story's yet being told. Yeah, definitely want to have you on another show. I think that topic can go really deep. My last question before I let you go. Your top five of all time. <laughs> uh, okay. All right. Uh, a, a tough list. Uh, there's always a one A, B, and C. Um, I come from, uh, an era where we talk about the big man. So, uh, in the middle, uh, I've got to have Kareem. I'm probably going to go, it, it's a toss up between Malone and Duncan. Yeah. You got to go, you got to go bird. Um, and, and then, you know, there's a lot of other, uh, you know, Bernard King, when you talk about scoring, so, um, but when I, when you talk about championships and making people better on the floor, you know, hands down that if that's your conversation Then bird is your man. So, so I would say magic, Jordan, Jabbar, I'll go, I'll go Duncan and Larry Bird. And that's why me and my listeners like the 80s and 90s. Kevin, it was a pleasure to have you on the show, man. Thank you, Sean. Appreciate you. Um, um, look forward to, you know, uh, you know, following up with you on some of the other stuff. I'm pretty close to all the stuff that's happening. Uh, so uh, let's keep it moving. Uh, you and your listeners, uh, thanks so much for having me. And uh, you be blessed. <laughs>